Well, if I can't preach after that, something's wrong with me. <laughs> Let's just uh, get right into it, all right? Let's open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 14 through 17 today. Uh, we're wrapping up a series, our Risky Church series, and it's, uh, today's message is called Risky Reading. If you miss the other uh, messages in the series, you can just go to our YouTube page. Just type in CCC Mooresville. It'll take you to all those videos. But really, if you get today's, uh, you're good with all of them. Because really the thing is, is if you read the Bible in a risky way, in the way that the early church read the Bible, you're going to have all of the other risky behaviors as part of the norm. Uh, you're going to have risky conversations with other people around you. You're going to have risky fasting and prayer. You're going to have risky relationships because when you read God's Word in a risky way, it challenges you and pushes you to move forward. I, um, I saw this video, and I think so many times we just take God's Word for granted, don't we? I mean, I've got like 15 Bibles in my office, right? I, I've got my Bible on my iPad. I've got my Bible on my phone. If I need something, I just go to BibleGateway.com, type in a word search. I, I've got uh, this amazing program called Logos that I study from, and I go in, and I type in the Bible verse, and I can double-click on a word. And what used to take me 20 hours in Bible college, right? It's there in an instant. Uh, and I can see like the original Greek usages of words and all this amazing stuff and commentary and it's all there in a split second. But you know, not everywhere is like that, right? I, I saw this uh, video of some Chinese believers getting their very first Bible. Take, take a look at this. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I don't run to my Bible with that kind of excitement every day. Do you? I, I'm, I'm not kissing it because I know it's the very Word of God that He's going to speak to me. Now, I, I think that um, sometimes we can get so overexposed and we have so much abundance of stuff. We have so many resources that we forget to appreciate what we really do have. You know, this is God's Word. It, you realize there, there were generations that went... They never heard a word from God. God was silent. There, there were generations where the Old Testament had been written, the scrolls, and they're tucked away. And, and nobody was able to read the word of God. And we have it. It's right here for us. And so I think we should read it in a risky way. And I, I want us to see what Paul told Timothy. And so let's look together. You know, the goal is what he told Timothy just a chapter before. It's that we should do our best to present ourselves as a, a, a workman of God. Uh, no need to be ashamed. They you can rightly divide the word of truth. Be able to look at God's word and be able to understand it and be able to spread it out to other people. That's really our goal. But how you get there is by reading it in a risky way. And so we're going to look at what Paul told Timothy about risky reading. And so Paul, Paul's writing to his protege, Timothy. Uh, he, he led him to faith in Christ. Timothy had a godly heritage, a godly Jewish heritage from his mom and his grandma. Uh, and they raised him up in the scriptures. And Paul came along and told him about Jesus who fulfilled the scriptures and discipled him in the faith and took him on mission all around the world. And now Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy has been stationed at one of Paul's church plants, he's overseeing it and uh, he's trying to set up elders there. And he's run into stuff all along the way and Paul's writing to his beloved son, he would call him Timothy, uh, about some things about the scriptures. He just talked about how false teachers are starting to spring up in the church. People who just tell folks what they want to hear instead of really talking about the word of God. And he says, Timothy, you're not going to be that guy. That's not going to be you. You're going to be true to the faith. 
And you're going to read God's word and share God's word in a risky way. And so here's what he says. Verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you've learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you've learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. From the time that a Jewish boy was five years old, they would start to train them in God's word. They, they would learn the Old Testament. They would teach them about the scriptures. And so he says, from the time you're a little boy, Timothy, I want you to remember all the scriptures that you learned. They didn't bring you to faith. Like notice it doesn't say that scriptures made him saved. They brought them to a place where he knew he needed salvation. They brought him to a place where he knew he needed a savior. And so he was introduced to Jesus. And so look what he says. He, verse 16, all scripture. How much? All. All scripture is breathed out by God. That phrase can be really confusing, but here's what it means. It means it's inspired by God. God went to men and to women and he said, I, I want you to write my word. And he didn't dictate it. it was, they weren't secretaries with a notepad. But he would speak his word to them and then in their own personality they would write it out. And it was God's word. Here's what it says. It's profitable. That means useful for four things. Look at what it says. For teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete. That word means qualified. So you can be qualified, equipped for every good work. He says, Timothy, here's the deal. You're, you're, you're going to face lots of different things, lots of different challenges as a man of God, as a pastor, as an elder, as you set up other elders. And no matter where you go, you're going to face lots of challenges. But here's the thing. God's word is the answer. God's word, when you read it in a risky way, it's incredible. God's word is profitable for all of these things. He lists out four things and he says, the reason you have all of this scripture is not so that you can know a lot. The reason that you have all this scripture is so that you can be qualified and equipped and ready to do whatever God calls you to do. Whatever happens that day, you're ready. You're ready for it. If I had to look at the way that they uh, read God's word in a risky way, it would be this. They, they, they had three things, right? Um, they studied it, they knew it, and they lived it. That, that was their process. They studied it, they knew it, and then they lived it out. That's what they did with God's word. Scripture had its purpose fulfilled. Paul says there were four things that scripture was for. And, and they let it fulfill all of those. Listen, they knew that if you read God's word in a risky way, you were going to understand verses that you needed to fast and pray about. You would say, God, I need wisdom. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at God's word and I'm going to see where I can find wisdom. And so I'm going to fast and pray about that and dig into God's word. I, I, I have this situation where I have a friend who's lost and... I need to know what to tell him, so I'm going to make myself available to give an answer for the hope that I have within me. And so I'm going to study God's Word, and I'm going to be ready to give an answer to a risky conversation. I, I, I'm going to find out what a mature believer looks like. This is what a mature believer looks like from the Word of God. And so I'm going to spot somebody, and I'm going to say, you need to be my Titus 2 partner. You need to help me along in the faith. We're going to help one another. Uh, listen, they knew that if you read God's Word in a risky way, you would see all these examples of generosity and it would cause you to want to be generous people. You would have the right priorities because you would prioritize God over everything, even before activity or any other stuff. He would be Lord over it all. Risky reading affect every other risky behavior. That's, that's what they knew. And so um, today I, I want to talk to you about the four things that he said scripture was good for, what it was beneficial for, what it was useful for. But before, before you can study it, you got to know why it's there. You got to know what it's good for. And so today, um, if you're a guest with us, our sermon is a little different today. It's going to be more like a, a class and less like a sermon. But that's okay. You come back next week and you get the sermon part. All right, it'll be all right. Um, but, but today, I just have some really practical things because I hear people say all the time, I just can't get anything out of reading God's Word. I, mean, I just don't know where to start. Where do I start? What do I do? And so I just want to give you some really practical things to do as you read God's Word. And so if you've got your bulletins, open those up, jot down some notes. Uh, but I want to talk to you about what God's Word is there for. He tells them it's there for four things. The first thing is for teaching. For teaching. Write that down. It's for teaching. That's one of its purposes. That's why you have this book. That's why you have God's Word. And here's what teaching means. It's to form the lens through which you look at everything. This is your worldview maker right here. You don't look at your worldview based on your bank account. 
Like, you don't look at your worldview based on how nice your kids are being that day. Like, you don't, you don't look at your worldview by whether or not your spouse has been generous or whether they haven't been generous. You don't look at, at your worldview do anything except do what the Bible says you should look at it through, right? Um, one of the things that Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, we've all been given these gifts by the Holy Spirit. And we're supposed to use these gifts to work together. So that every person can reach a mature place. So that when vain philosophies come in, people aren't tossed to and fro like waves on the ocean. But they're able to stand strong. Listen, that's part of what God's Word is supposed to do. You're supposed to read it and it forms every outlook. This is what marriage should look like. Not what society says marriage should look like. This is what finances should look like. Not what uh, the credit card company says finances should look like, right? This is what my priorities should be. This is what's important. Not what the car company tells me is important. This is what's luxury. Not what this is, right? Everything shapes your view of how you look at things. You're bombarded by images all day long. But the Bible should be your lens maker. It should be profitable for teaching, number one. Number two, write this down. For rebuking. For rebuking. That's the second one. That sounds like a fantastic word. I love some good rebuking, all right? <laughs> now listen, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23, there's a great story about Josiah. I want you to go back and read it. But jo Josiah was eight years old when he was made king. How many of you have eight-year-olds? You think they'd be a great king? Uh, fantastic. Yeah, you're going to put them in charge of a country? That shows the Lord's provision right there. The country didn't fall apart. All right? L listen, he's there and his dad was horrible. His dad did not love the Lord. His dad ran after all these other false gods. In fact, they filled up the temple of God with Baals and Asherah. They, they filled up all of these false gods all over the entire land of Judah. And this was all he had known his entire life until he was eight years old. When he was eight years old, all of these men got together and killed his father. And then the people said, no, we're not going to let you do that and take the throne. We're going to kill all of you and then we'll make an eight-year-old king. So that was the way that it happened. And so he's there. He has this ungodly history. But as he grows up, he wants to find out more about God. And so he finds out the temple's in disrepair. He, he's about 26 years old at this point, 18 years into his reign. And so he calls for the temple treasury, the, the tax that people pay as they go in. He says, let the workmen make repairs to the house of God. And uh, there's all these other false gods that are there in the house. And as they go through and as they're cleaning out and they're rehabbing, they're, they're rehabilitating the house of God, they find the book of the law. They find the scriptures. You know that even the high priest didn't read the scriptures at that time? Like nobody. They, they had gotten so far away from God, even the people that were supposed to be closest to God, they were serving other gods too. And in that moment, they find the scriptures, he breaks it out, the scroll, and it, he gives it to the secretary of the king. He reads it, he takes it to Josiah, and he reads it, and his first instinct is, I gotta rip my clothes. I'm torn. I can't believe that we've done this. How did our ancestors fall so far from where we've come? This is not right. What are we doing? We're, we were headed this way as a country and now we're headed this way. What are we going to do? And so he rebukes the people. He, he shares it. His first instinct is we've got to share it. And then he goes and cleans house. He gets out all the false gods out of the temple. He goes and he desecrates all the bales, all the Asherah, uh, sacred spots. He gets rid of the temple prostitutes. He, he gets rid of everything. And he worships the Lord. You know there are times in God's word where he just says, what are you doing? <laughs> right? And just, it's a wake up call. You know, it, it's like David and Nathan, you know, David committed adultery and then he fathers this child out of wedlock and then he ends up where he murders a guy. And then all of a sudden, Nathan comes up and slaps him upside the head, basically. He says, what are you doing? You're the man. You're the one that's done this. And what does he do? He repents. Oh, God, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, oh, God. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Renew a right spirit within me, right? You get Psalm 51, this beautiful picture of repentance. And the Lord restores him. And at the end of his life, God looks at David and says, He's a man after my own heart. The Bible is there to rebuke you and say, You need a major course correction. You need to turn it around. It's good for teaching, for your lens, right? For rebuking. But then the third one is for correcting. How many of you go to a chiropractor? Seven people. Fantastic. All right, I'll have to come up with a new illustration real quick. Now, uh, 
When, when you go to a chiropractor, they adjust you back into alignment, right? Now, um, if you have discs that are over here, and they should be here, they can't help you, right? Uh, you need surgery for that. Uh, but if you're just a little out of alignment, and you need to be lined back up, they're the people to go to. This is the same word that correction means. It means your life's just a little off course, right? You're reading something and you just allowed this sin to come into your life. Like you've given it a temptation here. Or maybe you're thinking in this thought process this way and you're starting to value riches more than you should. Or you're starting to think about this more than you should. Or you just let lust come in a little bit. Or you let anger, whatever it is. And it just seeps into your life. And it just starts to make you just a little off course. I mean, you're not like murdering anybody. But like you're just off course. And if you leave it that way, it'll go all the way off course, right? And God's Word says, no, you just need to auto-correct. You need an alignment. Back into alignment. That's the third thing that God's Word does. And then the fourth thing is this. Write this down. It's training. It's training. It's preparation to live out what God's calling you to do. You know, Paul says, um, he says, if I run a race, I'm going to run it to win it. Only one wins the prize. So I beat my body. Like I train, I run so I can win the prize. I, I'm not like these guys that shadow box and just beat the air. I discipline my body and bring it under the submission of Christ. He says, listen, when you read God's word, it should train you. It's making you ready for what you're going to face that day. It's making you ready for what you're going to face that week with your kids or your spouse or your coworkers or whatever it is. It's preparation, right? Uh, he, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul talks about the armor of God. What, what's the word of God? What, what, what piece of the armor? Sword, right? It's the offensive armor, right? It, 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 it's the offensive weapon. And so what you do, whenever you're reading God's word, you're training. You're like bulking up. You're like, you're getting swole up like you got roids on. I mean, you are... You are ready. You're bulking up for the fight, okay? It's like, yeah, which way is the gym? You're, you're, you're packing the ammo in so that you're ready for the fight that's going to happen. Because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And so anytime you're reading God's Word, you're training, you're getting ready, you're packing up the ammo so that you're ready for the fight. That's, that's what the four things are that it was for, okay? So that's what God's Word is for. It's for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and then for training. Alright, so how do you read that in a risky way? Alright, here's where it gets really practical. Uh, they studied it, they knew it, and then they lived it out. And so I, I'm going to let you figure out the know it and the live it out part. I just want to focus on the study it. I want to tell you some really specific, practical ways that you can study it this week, okay? And so I broke it down in three sections. Before you study it, while you're studying it, and then after you're studying it. Okay, I just got some tips of here's what you can do to read God's Word in a risky way like the early church did. You ready? So here you go. Before it, the first thing you got to do is prepare your attitude. you got to prepare your attitude. This is God's Word, right? This is God's Word. And I want you to think about that. There were generations where the Word was hidden away, right? Uh, it, it was undiscovered. And then Josiah brings it back out and the whole nation gets back on course again. There, there were years where the Lord didn't speak and only a few people had access to His Word. We have the entire Word of God at your disposal. Every single day you can hear God speak. Do you realize only a handful of people in the Old Testament actually were able to hear God's voice speak to them through the Holy Spirit? You have that every single day if you're a believer. Right there you can open up God's Word and you can read it and he can speak to you. It's amazing. You've got to get your attitude ready. Don't go into it flippantly. All right, I've got two minutes, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm picking up the kids in car line. So let's see, uh, devotion time, right? No, I mean, that's not what it's about. Listen, this is your time with the Lord. Prepare your attitude. Get ready. Get ready. Expect God to teach you something. And the second thing is this. Remember what your purpose is. Like, if you can just star this one, Okay, this is like the biggest pet peeve on earth that I have at this moment. Okay, here's what I hear people constantly say. And I even see it, like I am, I, I want to I wanna make this clear. I am not anything special about being able to read God's word. Anybody can read God's word in the same way I read God's word. But I see people that are like these national speakers and they do the same exact thing when they write down stuff and they do devotionals. Don't, don't get me wrong, like I think devotionals are great. But when you pull one verse and that's all you have, and then you write like a page about it and you have no clue what happens in the verses before that, the verses after that. There's, you, need, you need to like do your research with stuff, right? But, but here's my point. I'm sorry, I went off on a little tangent. All right, check it back. Let the Spirit speak, David. All right, fantastic. Here, here's the biggest mistake that I see. 
When you look at God's word and you say, what does God's word say to me today? That's a huge mistake. What does God's word say to me? You know what that does? That takes the precious word of God and it makes you the arbiter. You're the one who decides what it says. Like you look at it and you're like, well, yes, I'm going to filter this through all of my situations, all of my circumstances, all of my scenarios. And then that's what God is saying to me for the day. Do you see it? Like that makes you God. You're the one who decides what it says. What's God say to me? Right? It's about you. This book is not about you. It's about him, right? It's about his love for you. Here's what you should ask instead. What does God's word say? And then how does he want to apply that to me? That's two totally different things. Like if you go into a passage and you're like, what is God saying to me? You're going to filter it all through you. If you say, what does God's word say? How does he want to apply that to me? You filter you through it. You see the difference? Like God's word is the thing that's saying something, not you. It's, this is what God's word says. I'm going to take my life and I'm going to filter it through the word instead of taking the word and filtering it through my life. You see the difference? Your purpose is not to say, well, this is what God says to me. Because he can't say something different to you in a passage than he says to me about what it actually says. He can apply it differently, but he's not going to say, oh, well, you know what? This is okay for this person and this is not okay for this person. That's not how God works. Either he said it or he didn't, right? And he can apply it differently, but he can't say something different. It's whatever his word says. So when you go into it, you say, now, God, uh, what would you say to me today? And you say, what are you saying, God? What are you saying? What does your word mean? How do you want to take that and apply that? to my life today. What does your word say that you could apply to any person in any generation, in any circumstance, in any culture, all across the gamut, a hundred years from now, a thousand years ago, what does your word say that would apply to anybody? And now how do you want to take that, what you've said, and then apply that specifically to me today? That's two totally different things. You see it? You see the difference? I hope I'm explaining that right. All right, number three. This is all beforehand, okay? Number three, you ask the Lord to reveal something to you through His Spirit. God, I need you to show me something today. Please speak to my heart. Speak to me. Show me what your Word says. Show me how you want to apply it today. All right, now you ready? Here we go. Now you're actually opening the Bible. And so when you get there, here's what you remember. When you're studying, when you're in the middle of the study, in the during, here's what you do. Remember this. Number one, context is king. Now how many of you, if you went in mid-season on The Bachelor and you just turned it on, you wouldn't know who all the crazy women are? You've got to watch all the way from the beginning, right? I mean, you just can't know the crazies right up front. You just don't expect to automatically know that. But you do that with God's Word. I mean, you like flip it open in the middle of a book and you're like, bam, that's the verse for me today. God, what do you want to say to me today? And you're like, you have no clue who they're writing to. You don't have no clue what's going on. I mean, you wouldn't do that with anything else. You wouldn't just open up Twilight and like get to page chapter 7 and you're just like, oh, I didn't know Edward was this. Whatever it is. Like, you would never do that. You would be like, I'm reading the prologue and whatever it is, right? Like, you would, you would be reading the bio of the author so you could find out whoever this was and how they cheated Harry Potter out of whatever it is. I don't know. Whatever it is. Like, whatever crazy novel you're reading. You would understand who they're writing to. You would understand why they're writing. You would understand who the characters are and what they're saying. You need to do that same thing with God's Word. Context is everything. Listen, um, I'm going to give you a couple of big ones that a lot of people get out of context. You ready? Here we go. How many of you have ever heard a pastor, right? The end of the sermon. Brothers, sisters, today I want to tell you the Lord is standing at the door of your heart. And the Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would open the door unto me, I'll come in, I'll eat with him and sup with him, never leave him. Brother, sister, you need to respond to the call of the Lord and get saved today. Right? How many of you? Amen. Amen. That's right. That's right. Uh, do you know that verse was not written to non-believers? It's written to the church. It's written to the church. It's in the book of the Revelation in a letter to the church, to people that are already saved. It's talking about fellowship with God. Open the door for fellowship to Him. It's not talking about getting saved. 
There's other verses for that. That's important. But, but that's not about that. What about this one? God will never give you more than you can bear. Do you know that that is not in the Bible? That's not in the Bible. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, God will not give you any more temptation than you can bear. But God's faithful. When you're tempted, He'll provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. It's not about temptation. It's not talking about your circumstances. God will give you more than you can bear all the time so that you rely on Him instead of yourself. So He's God instead of you, right? Um, what about this one? Um, I love this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I want to tell you, that was not so that you could make the varsity basketball team. <laughs> right? You have a six-inch vertical jump. It's not going to happen. Right? It, it, it's not so that you can go out and you can kill the big 12-point buck. It's not so that you can, can hit the lotto. Yes, Powerball for Jesus. Right? I promise I'll tithe, Lord. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm going to tithe on it. I promise. Like, if you win that, seriously, tithe on that, though. That's... I'll take your evil money and we'll make it we'll make it for the kingdom of God. So a lot of people can get saved off of that. But listen, like, do you know what Paul was talking about? He wasn't talking about like bench pressing weights. He's not like, yeah, baby, I'm gonna lift 400 today. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Ugh! You know, like that's that's not what he's talking about. The context of that verse, he says, I've known what it is to have nothing. And I've known what it is to have everything. I've known what it is to be rich. I've known what it is to be poor. I've known what it is to have my belly filled. I've known what it is to be hungry. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's talking about his wealth or his poverty. He's not talking about you making the high school squad. Right? Like we take stuff out of con context as king. You, you have to ask yourself, all right, what happened right before this? What happened right after this? Who's this to? Why are they writing this? And the way that you can find that out is number two, in, in the during, you get some good study tools. One of the ones that I recommend, I use it all the time myself, it's ESV Study Plus. It's a great app on your phone, iPad, any of that stuff. They have an online version that you can do on your computer. It's fantastic. You, you're reading God's Word, and then if you swipe your finger to the right, you see all of these people that are way smarter than me and way smarter than you, like who have all these unbelievable degrees and know God's Word incredibly, and they've laid out everything that you need for study and maps and intros, and here's who they're writing to, and here's the context and all this stuff. Get some good study tools, right? So beforehand, you're like praying, prepping your attitude. You're remembering, it's not what is God saying to me. It's what does His Word say? And now, how does He want to apply that to me? And then, God, please, today, show me something from your Word. And then you dig in and you're remembering the context. What's before? What's right after? Who's, who, what, when, where, why? All of that. And then your study tools. And then what do you do afterwards? You ready? You just walk away, right? No. Here's what you do afterwards so that you take it home. Here's what you do. You ask the Lord to narrow it down to a takeaway. Okay, God, here's what you said. Here's how you applied it to my life. Okay, so God, what's the takeaway for me? How do I live this out? Because you can know lots of great stuff, and if you don't live it, it doesn't matter. The Pharisees knew God's word up and down, but they didn't, they didn't live it out with their hearts. They just lived it out in ritual. So, so here's what you do. You say, okay, God... I know your word says it's profitable for teaching. God, is there something in my worldview that's off? Like, am I valuing this and I shouldn't? Uh, Lord, what is it you need to teach me today so that I'm looking at life the right way? God, how is it that you want to rebuke me? Am I like over here and, left, and you need to bring me all the way back? God, what is it you need to correct in me that, that's just off a little bit? But God, if I don't get it back on course now, it's going to end up over here. God, what do you need to train me for? Is there something that I'm going to face today with my wife or with my kids or with my work or with my neighbor? Is there some situation I need to be equipped and geared up for so that I'm ready for the battle? God, what's that one takeaway that you want me to have? And then once you have it, write it down. Write it down. Alright? Listen, we need to read God's Word in a risky way. If we really want to be like the early church, we've got to read it that way. We've got to study it, we've got to know it, and we've got to live it out. So this week, my challenge is simple. Will you do that every day this week? Let's pray. This morning, uh, if you feel convicted by that video, like I do, 
You see these people that are flocking to God's word and they're just cherishing it. If you feel convicted about that, just confess that to God and repent of it right now. Listen, let's be risky in our reading. It's, God's word is there so that you can study it and know it and live it. And the reason that you have it is so that you can be taught. It can shape your worldview. You can be rebuked so that your life that's off course can have a radical adjustment. So you can be corrected, right? Just get it right back on course. And then so that you can be trained so you're ready for whatever happens that day. You've got ammo for the battle that you need. So this week, my, my challenge is simple. We've had a challenge every week. Here's what I want you to do this week, every single day. If you do it in the morning, that's great. If that's what you like to do when you wake up at lunchtime, whenever it is, whenever you have time to actually do it, here's what I want you to do. Commit to do it every single day this week. I want you to follow this method. You just get ready. Beforehand, prepare your attitude. This is God's Word. Don't rush it. Remember, it's Him speaking to you. And remember your purpose. You're not filtering God's Word through your life. You're filtering your life through God's Word. So you're not asking, what is God's Word saying to me today? You're saying, what is God's Word say? And how does He want me to apply that today? Right? Then as you get in, remember context is the king. What happened right before? What happened right after? Who's He writing to? Who, what, when, where, why? All of it. So you really get a grasp of what you're reading. And then I want you to look at some study tools. So you can learn some more. And then when you've got it all narrowed down. And you figured out God this is what you've said in your word. And God these are some ways that you want me to apply what you've said. Then I want you to narrow it down. Say God just give me one. What's my action step today? God, what's the one thing I can take away? Lord, is there something I need to be taught so that my worldview changes? God, is there something that I need to be rebuked about? Is there something that I need to be corrected in? Just a slight adjustment, a realignment? God, is there something in my life that I need to be trained and ready for today so that I'm ready when the battle comes? And then I want you to write it down. Will you do that this week? When we read in a risky way, every other risky behavior will follow. Lord, I pray that you would just do that this week in my life. I need it. God, I need you to do that in my life. And I need you to do that in every other person's life here. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.